Hello, and welcome back to the Trauma-Informed Organization. This is part two. If you haven't already, please make sure that you watch part one before continuing. It really has vital information that will be crucial to understanding what we're talking about in part two. As we get started, I want to acknowledge that several of the concepts in this training are drawn from the work of therapeutic crisis intervention, an evidence-based trauma-informed work that's happening out of uh, Cornell University. So in this training, we're really going to cover all of the essential elements of what it means to be trauma-informed and more broadly, what our organizations or companies can do to ensure that they're trauma-informed as well. In this training, we are going to focus on working with young people, but I want to emphasize that this really can apply to anyone who has experienced trauma. So let's just quickly review the trauma history behaviors that we talked about in part one. So we have things like withdrawal, difficulty with authority and criticism, anxiety and discomfort with feelings, impulsivity, risk-taking, distrust of others, irritability and outbursts, hyperarousal, avoidance and numbing, changes in academic performance, and decreased attention or concentration. These are all things that we can see from folks who have experienced trauma. So as you look at this list, think about a young person or any person that you've worked with who exhibits any of these behaviors. Even one is enough. I want you to pause this training and take a minute on your worksheet to answer these questions. What was the behavior that you noticed? Was there anything in the immediate environment that triggered that behavior? It's possible there wasn't, but you know, it's always a use useful thing to think about. Uh, why did you think that this behavior was happening? If you think back to the Navigating Youth Emotions training, which you've hopefully seen, what was the feeling, the need, or the want that the young person was trying to solve or to get or to fix? What uh, about this context made the behavior maladaptive? As in, why did that behavior help meet the need where you were? Can you imagine a situation where that behavior might be a helpful coping mechanism? So take a second and kind of work through these. You'll definitely need to pause the video. So all of these behaviors that we are talking about can also be called pain-based behaviors. These behaviors have several characteristics. First, they are learned over time. So what do we mean by this? Essentially, they're behaviors that a young person developed probably over years during their childhood. Spoiler alert, this also means that changing them cannot happen overnight. In most cases, they were actually skills that the young person developed uh, that helped them survive in childhood. So a child faced with a volatile parent is going to learn to withdraw or to be alert all the time without even realizing that that is not really typical. These behaviors are also patterns. So there's something that triggers the behavior and then usually the behavior follows whatever the young person learned when they were younger. So one thing to remember here is that you might not be present for the trigger. Sometimes it might be obvious, something that happens right in front of you, but Sometimes it might be something that happened before they got to you that day. Lastly, pain-based behaviors are not really known to the person as being pain-based. They are as normal to them as pulling your hand away from a hot stove would be to us. It's what they grew up doing. It's all they've known often. I've worked with many young people who, when discussing some incident afterwards, not only could not identify a different way to respond, the idea that there were different ways to respond hadn't even really occurred to them because they'd never seen anything else. Often when we're dealing with pain-based behaviors, we can find ourselves saying to ourselves, our self-talk, some version of this, what's wrong with this young person? This could be a young person who is very late every day or who gets defensive really quickly, or it could be the person who cuts us off in traffic or is rude in line at the grocery store. Often our first instinct, and we may not even be aware of it, is to say to ourselves, geez, what is their problem? The trauma-informed approach above anything else 
asks us to change the question we're asking. There's a lot more to it uh, than and what it can mean to be trauma-informed, but really the root of it is this shift. It feels like it should be easy to make, but in practice, it's harder than it seems. The shift that we're making is away from what's wrong with you and towards what happened to you. If you take nothing else from this training, I hope you take this. I can say for myself that in my own work, this shift changed everything for me. Uh, and as an aside, you can bring this from work to the rest of your life and it can be quite the game changer. So when we make this shift, we are activating the part of our brain that is curious and empathetic instead of the part of our brain that's judgmental. And that is really key for showing up for traumatized young people in the way that they need us to. So a brief story time. I once met someone who worked in a residential care facility. He was in charge of getting everyone up in the morning. And every day there was one young guy who he said was always giving him trouble. As he saw it, it would take him ages to get this young man up. He'd have to come in and practically drag him out of bed. He absolutely thought to himself, what is wrong with this kid? Why can't he get up? He said that everything changed for him. The day that he learned that young man's father used to beat him out of bed every morning. In that context, this young person's behavior made total sense. And it was what had happened to him that really explained everything. So when we can make this shift, then the next question we find ourselves asking is, well, how do we best respond to young people in ways that are helpful? I want you to take just a minute and brainstorm on your worksheet, what kinds of things that you feel could be helpful? What have you maybe seen other people do or done yourself? What would be helpful for you? Just take a minute and make your own list. We're going to go through these. And as we do, I want you to fill out on your worksheet for yourself, sort of where you feel like you are within each of these, sort of your own like bar chart almost. Do you feel like you've got this one? Is this something that you wanna work on? Remember, none of us have mastered all of this and that's absolutely okay. That is why we're here. So the first thing that we can do is listen. We don't wanna push young people to talk until they're ready to talk. Sometimes as adults, we want young people to talk because we feel like it will help them or because we're curious about what happened or because it feels like that's sort of moving forward to us. But often young people first need space to feel their feelings safely. Talking isn't, isn't always moving forward. If you want to work on your listening skills, check out our what to say when you don't know what to say training for lots of tips and ideas. Second, we need to accept their feelings. I wanna spend a minute here because often when I say this, people say, but it wasn't okay that they yelled at someone or it's not okay that they're late every day or insert some other behavior here. And so I want to make it very, very clear here that we are talking about two different things, feelings and behavior. Everyone has a right to their feelings, even if we don't understand them or they seem strong to us. Our job, as the adults in young people's lives is to help them see the separation between feelings and behaviors. It is okay to feel angry. It's not okay to push someone when you're angry. It's okay to feel frustrated. It's not okay to throw something at your instructor when you're frustrated. Often when people hear that we need to accept and validate feelings, they assume that means we're accepting behavior and we are not. But the trick of this is, Behavior change cannot and will not happen while we're denying young people's feelings. Another helpful way to respond is to reduce other sources of stress for that young person. So are there other people around watching them? Is it hot or loud or crowded? Are they hungry or thirsty? Are they dealing with a staff person that they have a difficult history with? So I'll share something a little more personal. So I, I'm an anxious flyer. It's better than it used to be, but back when it was fairly bad, I was on a plane that was delayed taking off. It was really hot on the plane, and there was a kid behind me kicking my seat, and the flight attendant was making announcements announcements in this very sort of irritating, like, ping kind of tone. And I very distinctly remember wanting to run off of the plane. 
I was already anxious. And then on top of that anxiety were these additional environmental stresses and it made it almost more than I could handle. If even one of those things had stopped, it would have been easier for me. But I had no control over that environment. I just had to bear it. But hopefully you have some control over the environments that you're in with young people and you can help reduce those external sources of stress. Another helpful way to respond is to be attentive to sudden changes. So if all of a sudden they stop talking or they get up and walk away, something is happening there. Pain-based behavior doesn't always look loud. Sometimes it's a shift. Another thing that we can do as individuals is remind them that people care about them and love them. I know on the surface, sometimes this might seem like it's gonna come off as cheesy or something, but if you do it authentically as you, you'll be really surprised actually. People need to hear this much more than we realize. And in fact, you might be one of the only adults in a young person's life who has ever said this to them. 